Um, what we've developed is an LED uh, lights, three very specific lights. We looked at many frequencies and um, we came across five specific frequencies that had this activating effect on mesenchyme stem cells. Um, they're no stronger than what you'd get coming out of your LCD TV. So, they're very, so it's the frequency that's specific. In every cell we have um, various different uh, alpha, beta, gamma and delta type chromosomes and um, they are the photoacceptor molecules in cells which allow um, different effects on the cells to happen. So we, we found three lights in particular gave a synergistic effect. Um, we looked at lasers first but we actually found that LED light was, was far better, gave a better result. When we look at the proliferation of adipose-derived stem cells control and we looked at the light but we put the PRP together with the light, we get far more activation principles. If you look at colony formation units um, and we take adipose-derived stem cells and we look how many colonies are formed after a few days, you'll see they are far more formed if they're photostimulated with PRP. Um, in that same cerebellar atrophy patient, when we gave him his adipose-derived stem cells, we saw slight implantation in, the, in his CNS. When we took the same cells and activated them a week later, we saw a far larger implantation in that area. So it seems to yield far more consistent effects clinically. Um, with the help of uh, Professor George Koliakos from Thessalonica in Greece, uh, he's, he's a nuclear medicine specialist. Uh, we all, we've been able to trace the stem cells. We're using radioactive tracers that have been used for white blood cell tracing in the past. And this is a, a scan f using Indium 111 of a 14-year-old boy with cerebral palsy. And you can see his cells uh, implanted. So it's quite nice to see that you can give the cells by IV and you can see them implanted in the CNS um, a day later. The whole procedure is a three-hour process from the time the patient walks in to the patient walks out. We're continually improving it to make it quicker and, and simpler. Um, like I said before, it, it, its opposition to bone marrow is that no, really the main criteria is the fact that you start with so many cells you don't need to expand them. And that's the beauty of it. So there's no real or any ethical or moral issues using these cells. So basically we tend to use abdominal fat, lower abdomen fat is shown to contain more mesenchyme stem cells. So there's, there are differences between sex and differences in anatomical areas. So it's a mini liposuction done by hand as suction from a machine will destroy these cells. Um, there's two processes. There's one where you can take a large number of cells and it's done in a closed system or in the syringe itself. Basically the lipid will come out the bot and up the top and your stromal stem cells will come out the bottom after emulsification, as you can see there. And basically we collect the fraction here, we spin it and we have our stromal stem cells, we mix it with the platelet-rich plasma and we shine the light for a few minutes. So what is a stromal vascular fraction that we're correct? It's not all adult mesenchyme stem cells. It's a plethora of different cells from small percentage of hematopoietic to endothelial precursors and progenitors and there's a lot of different activity going on in terms of progenitor and mesenchyme stem cells. This stromal vascular fraction with the help of uh, Biohellenica, who's, who's an excellent bank, um, cord blood bank in the Balkans, who've been working a lot with us, um, with uh, Professor George Koliakos, who's here today, and you can definitely see him. Um, has done a lot of work and has to preserve these cells. And so that's had a bit of interest in terms of banking these cells. Um, you don't always want to take out fat from patients um, and sometimes they require repeated dosing depending on the disease. We activate and then we can use the cells topically. This is what they've been used for clinically. We have many practitioners around the world using this and we learn from them as they learn from us. Wound healing, osteoarthritis and of course given back by intravenous to see a regenerative repair effect. One of the first things we did is look at uh, fat grafting where we're increasing the amount of stem cells in the fat itself to see if we can get a better uh, fat graft. And basically we've removed 
there's a typical pellet that's at the bottom once this, they've been centrifuged. There's the adipose stromal vascular fraction. Um, what it looks like under the microscope, those beautiful spherical cells are the ones we're talking about. And we took some of the patient's own fat as in its process for fat grafting, mixed their own adipose-derived stem cells to increase the number of activated cells and injected them into lumpectomy areas. So these patients were five years cancer-free who had a cancer removed from a breast. And we're looking at more as a cosmetic um, approach. And this is 48 hours later, and this is six months later, you can see that there's nice blood vessel growth as before and we got some very good results and great long-term uh, safety data from this. Um, many doctors who uh, I've worked with are, are using this procedure for face, fat grafts on the face, as well as breast augmentation. And this is a colleague of mine in Korea who's been doing this work. This is day after. You can see very limited bruising, and this is like 16 months after it's retained. Um, for facial reconstruction, this is work I did in Africa. Once again, this is a, a poor lady had a grenade blast and um, you get some pretty amazing results. Fat grafting, once again, this was done in Korea. Um, ten months later, you can see where, where there's a filler to maintain the graft longer and keep consistent results. Madonna has had this treatment done in Vienna. Um, for acne scarring, we've had a great cosmetic surgeon who just, just used the stem cells themselves into the uh, pocket of where the scar was. And this is a typical sort of result that he saw. And so another thing that we noticed with IV administration of these cells, we, we noticed some effect on the patients on the trials I'll talk about later on hair growth. So when we injected these cells into hair, or they needed repeated injections, they was able to see some hair growth. And this was done with a cosmetic surgeon who's an expert in the field. I'm going backwards. And this is once again with repeated dosage, you get this type of effect. Um, we've got a, a, a great plastic surgeon up in uh, Italy, and she also works out of Greece, who does follicle unit extraction. When the cells are used in combination with follicle unit extractions, it decreases the time for the grafts. It gives close to 98% graft survival rate, and, and they're getting some very good results with that. So that's another area that it's also used in. We've done a lot of wound healing, a lot of diabetic. Now, this is a, a classical example of a diabetic ulcer, which takes a long time to heal if they heal. And you can see the closure of the foot eight days later without a scar. So you see these, these type of results, and they're repeatable by different practitioners who use it. We're running a large trial on osteoarthritis. This is intra-articular injection of uh, adipose-derived stem cells into the knee. This was originally done in animals, mostly in dogs. Um, we also have a veterinary company that's been doing this procedure for quite some time. And now we're, we're running a trial, a multi-centre trial here in Australia as well as in Florida in the US with the orthopaedic surgeons. And basically we learned from the animals that we get some very strong regenerative effects in the cartilage area, in the knees and the hips. And it still needs to be assessed, but if you, if you take it from... The results we've had from animals, for example, this is a five-year-old rat terrier, chronic degenerative joint disease. We took some fat from its abdominal area, inguinal area, processed some cells, injected it into the joints, and you can see on the right, full extension of the hips under no physical or chemical restraint. This is a typical um, case, and they've done many dogs and horses. Another here's a, here's a horse with a typical subchondral bone cyst disappearing 30 days. It takes about 30 days to see improvement, 60 days is further improvement. And we're seeing similar results in humans as well with the orthopaedic surgeons. So when I look, going back to intravenous use of these cells, basically we take the cells, we give them back, we've done a lot of studies, probably from five years ago now, it's an old slide, but looking at some very severe cases that we did back then um, for humanitarian purposes, we see what was most surprising is that the type 2 diabetes patients, all seven had a reduction in their diabetic parameters. And this was of interest to us because you can't explain where do these cells go to change an endocrine disease. I mean, we didn't see any changes in parameters of the insulin. It's just a drop in insulin resistance. It just didn't make any sense to us. So it was of interest. So 
um, and I'll show later a trial we did on type 2 diabetes. Um, we're currently running a trial on idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. As you know, you're better off getting lung cancer. You have a higher survival rate getting lung cancer than you have with idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. Upon diagnosis, the average time is two years to live. We did a scan, although it's not very clear with the scanning technique, but you can see in the lung area there was um, traces of the cells there. Um, we had a very severe IPF patient with a few months to live who um, had an excellent result, had a reversal in his pulmonary function. It's unheard of, let alone if you could just stabilise them. And this work, we're currently halfway through a very large EU-approved um, trial in uh, Alexandropolis in Greece. Um, Professor Boros here is one of the world's experts in idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis and uh, we're looking forward to the results of that study. So far the results look promising. We're also running a trial, um, George Koliakos and his team is running a trial in Greece at one of the paediatric hospitals. We did an initial child because we had seen some results prior um, where we gave by intravenous administration these stem cells back to an autistic child and we saw some quite fascinating results and once again this was in the media and now a trial's being done and until that trial's fully assessed can we mention about the positive results of that. So going back to type 2 diabetes, classical example, one of the first patients done in 2006, 66 years old at the time, uncontrollable, um, refused to take insulin, didn't, didn't respond well to insulin which is probably the reason why he refused but uh, was on large metformin, um, not an obese diabetic, but a classical resistant, insulin resistant type 2 diabetic with very high sugar levels and a very high glycosylated hemoglobin. When we gave him his IV stem cells, and this is monthly, his fasting bl blood sugar levels went from 380 down, he's never been like that for about eight years from memory, and every month after that, analysing him, you can see it slowly come up. So, and his glycosylated haemoglobin um, had dropped severely. And this is the major indicator for type 2 diabetes as far as the disease parameter is concerned. This prompted us to do a, a, a formal clinical trial in the area with 30 patients, type 2 diabetics, that didn't have other parameters such as kidney disease and heart disease and so forth, and weren't on other medication. It was done by a group of endocrinologists. And... Looking at the statistics, there was a very clear statistical drop in fasting blood sugars, except for the 24th week time, but over the year, a whole year following up after one treatment, there was a drop. If we look at the main indicator for diabetes, as you know, is glycosylated haemoglobin, significant drop throughout the year. C-peptide was up and down, which really didn't tell us much, and that's it in a graph format. When we looked, it was also a safety trial, so we looked at hematological parameters which we measured every month. There was no change. There was no change in urolo urological parameters, creatinine or BUN. Total cholesterol didn't seem to change. However, triglycerides sig significantly dropped at three months and again after a year. Um, but the other parameters didn't change. We had to, we had to um, reduce insulin in five patients. Half of them were insulin dependent, half of them weren't. Um, and we had to de decrease uh, hypoglycemics and other reactions. So what I'm getting to at the point, and I'll quickly finish up because I can't get through it all, is um, mesenchyme stem cells, do they act, where do they go for type 2 diabetes? What do they do? We're seeing results that don't comply with the cell going to a particular area. It's an endocrine disease. And so... When we looked at these cells, we then looked at, okay, are they, are they really regulated multi-drug delivery stores? I mean, how else can you explain the clinical effects observed? And we've done a lot of work where we're trying to find what do these cells secrete. And we found a lot of various proteins. We've done it with the Australian Proteome Facility. And it's led to a plethora, a, a lovely peptide drug discovery platform, which we now have a candidate, a HIV candidate, which we're currently trialling in uh, South Africa. Uh, we're looking at a topical pain reliever and an anti-inflammatory type peptide. These are very unique peptides, which has come out from this research, from things stem cells secrete. Can you For come example, to a conclusion? 
conclusion. I'm concluding now. And for example, if we look at the HIV trial, eight weekly injections in the first 15 patients we've got has brought their CD4, CD8 counts normal and they're completely virus negative, whether they were on heart or not on heart. So this is the power of what these uh, stem cells can do if we further research them and understand their physiology. And I'd like to thank you very much and sorry for going over time. <laughs> Appreciate that. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Bill, for this very good overview and a very interesting uh, approach to diabetes type 2, which is...